So, so thank you, thank you every, everyone for coming out. It's, um, it's a little bit late for a lecture, so I've got these like special, if you start falling asleep, I'm gonna like start pounding you with some. So if I see anyone asleep, then that's the signal to wake up again. So what I'm gonna do is show you the sort of, well, actually before I say that, were any of you at the show last night? Did any of you come to the, okay, so quite a lot. Right, so last night was like the, the sort of club, you know, the club thing. Um, and a lot of people, I guess most people know me for music, but actually behind the visuals, there's lots of ideas. So I'll start off with the beginning of the show and I'll sort of run through a little bit what I did last night while talking about it. So I'm gonna basically be VJing and DJing and talking at the same time. So you're gonna to have to bear with me a little bit. Because that's, usually I just don't do the talking bit as well. But it's quite interesting to get to do so because there's lots of ideas in there which are nice to talk about. So it's a pleasure to be here. So thank you for having me. So usually I begin the show with this section about where things come from. So it starts off really before the physical universe is there. I wanted to start at this universe timeline, but I was thinking about what can I show scientifically which is underlying uh, nature. So what I do is I start with these forms, which are, this is actually a visualization of uh, Riemann's uh, zeta function. So I'm not gonna go into the, the maths of that, but the idea is that it's related to the prime numbers, and the prime numbers are the numbers which build all the other numbers. Um, and that's interesting because it, it's a starting point because I wanted something really fundamental, you know, what's, what's nature built of on a really basic level before we're going to the Big Bang, before things even exist as we know them, you know, what, what is there? And I thought counting is really fundamental to all of knowledge. Um, and numbers themselves are built of the primes. The primes construct all the other numbers. So they're the numbers that can only be divided by one and by themselves. And this is a, this is a sort of way of visualizing the structure of the primes. It's related to the structure of the primes. So what we're seeing is something really deep, I suppose, something deep in nature, something that underlies a lot of the way we think about the world. And that was a, a nice starting point for the show, really. And I worked with a mathematician on this, so this is just data visualization of the you know, built-in um, MATLAB with some relaxed music before the hectic techno begins. Um, so we have another, yeah, another, vis another way of visualizing the zeta function. And actually, what happens with this is that it goes into this um, ancient, ancient technique of choosing the primes called the sieve of eratosthenes. So this is a these orbits are orbiting with a period of, of primes, and when they go into these circles on the number, this is the number line from zero to infinity going across the front. It's basically a way of sieving out the prime numbers from the non-primes. So these, these ones here are the primes, you can see getting sieved out because they're not getting one of the orbits going into them. So this is like an ancient technique that people, you know, it's an ancient Greek technique, I think, that was used to pick the prime numbers out before we had, they had computers. Um, the reason I'm showing this is because it creates, what we're doing is picking out all the primes from all the non-primes and then rolling them up into a spiral to create something that's called Sack Spiral. Um, and Sack Spiral is one of the most important images behind the show. It's something which I ended up getting put on a t-shirt because it was so meaningful. And this was one of the really interesting things about this process, actually, because I, I approached this from the idea of, okay, I've got this idea of emergence, I want to show this sort of universe timeline of how, how things can come from natural law, how natural laws can give rise to the world around us. And the, this sort of research project, if you like, led me to this, you know, this image. And this image told a lot more than I ever expected it could, um, because, one of the really interesting things about this is I was looking for the most simple way of showing nature. Um, and yet, this, the most simple way I could find 
ends up with this image which you can sort of see patterns, you know, you can see some, some arches coming out of it. There's actually, when you expand it to have more, more numbers, you can see the patterns a little bit easier. But the interesting thing is that the patterns are always imprecise. So it really says that at a really fundamental level, nature is built of this combination of order and chaos. It's a little bit like when you look at a tree or a leaf, you can see that there's symmetries and structure there, but it's never perfect. And it's, everything's different in nature, you know? And even at this really simplified level of just numbers and the structure of numbers, we still see this pattern of, you know, there's, there's, there's order, there's some sort of these arch, arcs coming from it, but it's chaotic. We can't predict when the next one is. And actually mathematicians still can't predict, you know, when the next prime is, and they can't figure out, you know, if there is a precise way of defining the primes and how they're interspersed between the non-primes like this. Um, and I thought that was really, it's sort of poetic. And it, it, I suppose it links to this whole idea of this project, which is that I'm approaching science, but from an artistic perspective to see, you know, what it can say in, a, yeah, in an artistic manner and what the aesthetics are there and where there is beauty in science and what that means, you know? And this, this, this is really seems to be a fundamental part of that, this combination of order and disorder. So that's why I start the show with that. Um, so then we go on to some more work with the same mathematician, which is to do with, um, still this, we're still, you know, the universe hasn't, the Big Bang hasn't happened yet. We're still this early in this timeline. I mean, time doesn't even exist at this point in the show. This is um, just looking at the fundamental building blocks, what you need for time and, and for matter to happen, you know, for the world as we know it to start progressing. So this, this part of the show, this second chapter, um, we look at dimensionality. And it was something I wanted to do for a long time, which was to visualize higher dimensional forms because you know, scientists and physicists, they, they often use more than three dimensions of space when they're analyzing their data or, they, or you know, they play with forms which are of higher dimensional shapes. And you've probably heard of you know, 4D space time, for example, you know, in relativity, which uses a lot of mathematics of, in, in four dimensions. So, I wanted to visualize that as a way of bringing in this idea of dimensionality. And it's just another way of looking at something really fundamental in nature and something simple, but something which has a sort of artistic and an aesthetic you know, property, which is beautiful, I suppose, it's as simple as that. But actually, what we're seeing here appears to be warping shapes, but actually it's just, they're solid shapes, but they exist in four dimensions and they're being rotated. And because we're viewing it from a three-dimensional world, or you know, it's a slice, a three-dimensional slice through a four-dimensional uh, object, whenever they're rotating, it appears that they're warping. So we're just seeing something beautiful and artistic which emerges from um, simple mathematics, really. Um, and a mathematician who wanted to try this uh, experiment with me, uh, his name's Dugan Hammock, he's uh, in California. Um, so yeah, that's the hyper-shaped bit. I'm not going to, I can't spend too long on, I could really get sucked in and spend too long on these things and then we're not going to get through it. So there's actually before, in case I do miss some things, there's a website called emergence.maxcooper.net and that has all the chapters with, you know, some stills and videos and explanation written down. So if there's anything afterwards you'd be like, what did he say about that? Or you want to know more, then there's a website which has, has everything. So. Next, okay, so the next, the next chapter is something again really, really, um, a really important idea in all of science, which is symmetry. Um, symmetry is almost like another way of paraphrasing what natural law is, you know, it just says that if I pick up my beer and I drop it, it's going to fall to the floor and smash. And if I do it tomorrow, if I stand here tomorrow and I drop it as well, the same thing will happen. So there's symmetry, you know, there's the things, things are the same about time, or if I walk to that side of the room and drop it, it's gonna smash as well, because things are symmetrical about space. So symmetry is just, just a way of saying that certain natural laws are preserved, even if I change my position or the way I face or when I, when I sort of investigate that law. Um, and it really is, without symmetry, we'd just be in chaos. We couldn't, we wouldn't exist, you know? So 
this, was a, this wasn't um, the, the visual side of this part wasn't the collaboration with the mathematician, it was just a collaboration with a visual, you know, typical visual artist. And we just wanted to explore you know, different types of symmetries. We've got rotational symmetries, reflectional trans, you know, transpositions. Um, and then the music, I, should, I haven't really talked about the music yet, but I should explain a little bit about that. Um, the music is really scored to the visual. So the way I approached most of this project was a bit like uh, someone would, you know, like someone who'd make a score to a movie. I mean, essentially, I've got a 90-minute show or a two-hour show, um, and I know what, you know what I want in each part of the show, what the storyline is, and then I'm sort of writing music to fit the vibe, you know? What, what sort of ideas... In this one, I knew I wanted lots of flash-changing, you know, lots of different symmetries in this really complex, sort of glitchy experience. So I, I made a track like that, and then I sent the track to the visual artist and explained you know, what brief them and what I want. And this guy, Kevin McLaughlin, did this amazing, <laughs> intense um, job with this one, of this super hyper-edited um, visual experience, um, which gets even more crazy. And actually, for the live show, I have lots of additional controls, so I can sort of, I can sort of glitch it up and make it way more extreme than what you see here. I will see if I can do a little bit of that now while I'm chatting. So yeah, I can, I can basically have a lot of fun with this, messing around and messing with people's heads, you know, it's like, but it's also, that's the point of it, you know, the, the shows aren't supposed to be a science lecture, you know, the live shows. People will come to see me because they might like my music and maybe they're interested in visuals, but I don't want to hammer the science too hard. It's supposed to be about making a powerful audiovisual experience that people can appreciate on whatever level they're interested in, really. But behind every visual and every piece of music there are these ideas and these collaborations and, and because that's what I'm interested in but I, I try not to force feed that upon people but it's really nice like this this getting to do this now is great because I actually get to delve in and talk about these things which I usually don't get to and get to show all of the extra work I suppose that went in behind behind the scenes um, so let's get this back up but at the end as well, I'll, if, if there's time, I'll explain a little bit about the setup. But for now, I'm just going to continue explaining the the, um, the ideas behind it because I think that's you know this is a science this is a science thing, not a music thing, isn't it? So let's stick with the um, with the sciencey stuff. Okay, so there's one more pre Big Bang section, which is cool, which is by the same vid visual artist Kevin McLaughlin, uh, and this was another. Just another really important fundamental of nature, you know, before we get into real things. Uh, and this one's called waves, um, which I guess waves are such a ubiquitous um, concept across many areas of science and nature, and they're beautiful. So <laughs> that's why I picked them. I mean, that was the great thing about this project is that nature is full of so many beautiful things that it was just it really the project just grew and grew, and that's why I'm. You know, I'm still doing bits which seem to fit into it. It's just a never-ending um, source of beautiful, you know, visual and, and inspiration for making music. So this was another example where, you know, a very simple application of a very simple natural property just led to a nice audiovisual experience. Um, so one of the things I wanted to show in this was the idea that, you know, when you look at a wave, you often think of it as moving towards you, right? You know, it looks like the, the water is moving towards you in a wave. Or, But the, the point is that waves traditionally, obviously if they're crashing on the beach, then that's a bit different, but waves in the medium don't necessarily, or they don't actually have movement of the, the medium through it. You know, So you just have these single points going up and down, and the wave is the propagation of energy through, through that medium without necessarily the medium itself moving. So that was one of the fundamentals of this video, to show that idea of these single points, you know, like a, a particle moving up and down in, in its medium and transmitting the energy through. And it just, yeah, it just gives a really nice, it's a nice bold visual effect. And I went with this like old school sort of big, big analog synthy thing with this to try and match this you know, bold aesthetic that Kevin had come up with. 
So yeah, I won't stick too long on this one. I think I mean, it's, it's a really effective one for live shows, but in terms of the, uh, the science ideas, there, yeah, there's your single you know, particles moving. So, so that's basically, the, that's the end of the pre-matter section. So that's the end of my sort of fundamentals of nature, if you, if you want to put it that way. And then from that point on, we start with more um, hands-on, more you know, physical entities, beginning, of course, with the Big Bang. Um, I didn't want to bring, you know, when I first thought of this concept of emergence, I thought, oh, maybe, you know, that would start with the Big Bang. And then I was like, oh, no, that's a bit cheesy, isn't it? I don't want to just start with the Big Bang. And so, and actually, I'm really happy that I didn't do that because this pre, sort of pre-matter section was one of the most interesting parts of the whole project just because of the, just thinking about in that way, you know, about what can exist before, you know, the physical, what's required as a sort of basis for the physical world to emerge. Um, I mean, it ties a lot into this, you know, the old ancient, you know, Platonic realm ideas, you know, Plato's ancient ideas of these, whether there's this realm of perfect forms in which, you know, these natural structures exist. Um, and I know that's, you know, you could say, well, no, it's just, human construct really, you know, the, these ideas are, what, what I showed were, are, are more human constructs than they are anything in, really in nature, which is, which is fine, you know, people can come down either side on that argument, um, but either way, whichever side you come down, it was still an interesting, whether you see it as, you know, our understanding of what gives rise to the world around us, or something that's real, you know, either way, is, it's, it's an, it was an interesting starting point. Um, so now we go with the big bang without too much of a cheesy bang. I was like, I tried to keep it fairly subtle. I'll, give, I'll show you what I did though. Where's the big bang gone? I've lost it. Oh, yeah, here we go. So that's the big bang there. I'm white screen. So, I mean, I guess at this, this stage, I should apologize because if there's any, you know, I have a science background, I did computational biology. So I, I've a, I'm really interested in, in science in general, but this show is very much maximized artistic merit, you know, or, or artistic license. I, there's many imprecisions, you could say, which I've used for just because it looks nice, you know, it's, so there's, there's always that balance. So. Bearing that in mind, that was the Big Bang. Um, now we have you know, this sea of protons. And the whole idea with this was just to try and um, show the action of gravity, really. This was um, what emerges from the action of gravity. I mean, every chapter is showing a, a different facet of emergence, I suppose. Um, you know, looking at a different property of nature or a different process, and then what that can give rise to. So in this case, we have Gravity just acting on this sea of protons to and tiny inconsistencies in the density of the protons in, in the early universe. And, and the slightly denser regions have slightly more gravity and they pull the other, other protons towards them and it all starts amassing in the middle. Um, and eventually, of, of course, we're going to get nuclear fusion. Um, where's the music gone? Um, well, we don't really need the music, I suppose, but <laughs> but it should be in here somewhere. Ah, oh, there it is. It's weird. So it's another ambient track. Um, and it's just um, the artist was. Um, guy from the States and yeah he did a really beautiful job of just taking a really simple idea of just the action of gravity to create a star and I won't play the whole thing because it takes a while but it, it sort of gets fairly epic. I'm going to fast forward it a bit so it keeps on pulling, it keeps on pulling and then we get the seed, the star starting to grow in the middle. Here we go. And eventually this, this first star, nuclear fusion begins proper. We get this first star bursting into life and the music gets all intense and, you know. Here we go. 
And I wanted to continue the story and not just have um, the star, but actually have the star, the first star continue, the action of gravity continue until eventually it takes on so much mass that it collapses under its own weight to form a black hole. So that was how this part progresses. It eventually starts to go black in the middle and we get this little dot emerging. That's the, and again, this is like totally inaccurate. Um, I'm sure that that's not what it looks like when a black hole starts to form, or it, you know, but never mind. It's, that's the idea. That's the great thing about this project is, if a scientist says that's wrong, then I can say, well, it's art. So, you know, <laughs> which is nice for me. It's much nicer doing this. You know, I used to do academic presentations. You know, when I was presenting my my research and that would, you know, it, it was pretty tough if you know, someone could destroy me, but now I can get, I have the art get out of, get out of jail card or whatever. So now we've got the, the black hole. And it, I like the, the fact that it looks like, a bit like an eye as well. Some people think this is an eye. And it opens the door. The, the reason I wanted to have this part of the show, you know, progressing like that is, again, it opened the door for the next chapter to be us falling into the black hole. And then I got to do a bit about what it's like to be inside a black hole, which was another sort of free reign for some mad, you know, mad visual effect. So a lot, of, a lot of the show is structured in that way. You know, I was, it's always like thinking about this storyline, what sort of things would happen within that storyline, and how that could lend itself to a, a fun audiovisual experience. Um, so, I mean, it's been a really fun project to work on. So that one's sort of finished up and it gets really intense at the end. And it's all distorted and hectic. And then we fall into the black hole. And it's all out of sync because obviously I'm not paying proper attention to what I'm doing. So, the next bit would be inside the black hole. Um, the way we did that was uh, with a German woman called Susie C. And she's, she is a specialist of mixing oils and, and, and water and sort of these immiscible liquids. Uh, and I thought, what would it be like inside a black hole? It's going to be, well, light. You know, it's, there's so much mass, matter in there and so much gravity that light is getting pulled back in. So even light's getting twisted and, and warped. So we, we thought, all right, why not try and present that? Um, let's see if this should be the right one. Um, why not try and present this warped, slowly moving, um, beautiful structure? I mean, I won't spend too long on this because, again, this isn't science at all. This is me. This is, I guess maybe it's science fiction. I suppose that's all right, isn't it? We can get away with science fiction here. Um, so it's, it's just these complex structures, and your tiny complex structures of these different oil and, and water-based colors. The other thing I'll have to be careful of is that I, it's not actually in perfect order in here. I sort of, with the show, I have lots of different, um, sometimes I play shows, like a live show, to a sit-down audience like this, where I'm actually not talking, but actually just playing the whole show. And in, that, in those situations, I'll play much more of the ambient parts, and so I have lots of ways of structuring things in the system. Um, I have one, one laptop does the audio, and one laptop does the visual. Um, and all the controls do both, so that I can sort of more or less jam with the visual, uh, sorry, jam with the audio, and the visual happens in sync. Um, but I have lots of different options in terms of what track and how to edit it and edit, do lots of live effects with the visual and edit the audio so that there's a, there's a sort of live element where I'm interacting with people and trying to make it fit. I mean, last night, for example, it was quite, it was a, you know, it was a sort of quite a party type atmosphere. So it was a bit more intense, whereas sometimes I'll play the same, the same storyline, but with a much more relaxed sort of feel. So this is the nice work by Susie C, this Berlin-based, um, with her secret, she has these secret recipes of immiscible liquids, which she had, I had to swear I wouldn't tell anyone what she was doing. Um, I can't remember, so she's safe. Um, 
So from there, after that we start to go into um, planets. So obviously we've got, we've seen our you know, natural laws and structures, we've seen the Big Bang and okay, stars are starting to form and also now it's time for some planets to form. Um, let's see, I'm just going to do a horrible musical transition. Um, so this one, yeah, this one's a nice experiment um, with some smashed mirrors um, and projecting onto smashed mirrors. Um, and it, it gives a sort of fragmented universe sort of feel and then it transitions into this sort of planet emergence. There's a nice smashed mirror there and then there's a lot of um, sort of universe style particles floating in space theme, you know, but shone reflected off these fragments just for a nice visual effect really. Um, and then that goes into this section on the emergence of the first planet. Oh, well, actually, it's not the emergence of the first planet. Actually, what we see is Earth. Because I wanted to make it clear that, you know, what's happening is we're seeing um, Earth arriving. And again, totally unscientific. Um, this is not how the Earth came about. Um, this is like... Uh, I, basically, I mean, I was... A, a lot of the show was toying with these ideas of emergence in a visual sense. So not only in a scientific sense, you know, in terms of how can natural laws give rise to the world around us, but, I, but, but also in a visual sense, like, can I have some complex structure? You can't see what it is and then, you know, oh, it's the earth and you get this moment of, you know, it's nice to have that sort of emergent visual effect. And it helps me tell the story because trying to, yeah, I mean, I didn't have the budget to, visualize properly how the earth would emerge. I mean, if anyone wants to give me a million euros or something, you know, I'd love to do it. But this was this whole thing was done on a shoestring budget, really. Um, I was finding people, finding visual artists who were into what I did musically and were into the ideas and wanted to collaborate. You know, it was, it was very much, um, yeah, doing what we could. But actually, some, we got some really beautiful results and that's, the, you know, Sometimes it's the, the sort of the, the feeling and you know comes through without needing the super high budgets that Hollywood movies have. Um, so yeah, we've got lots of fragments and the earth emerges. I've already explained that, so I'll speed it up. You can see it coming. You get this nice process. So the show sort of intersperses between these you know, periods of um, using, you know, maximum artistic sort of license and then going back and forth between some real data, some hand-drawn things. It's a really uh, that sort of boundary between, you know, sciences and arts and music. It's very much in the middle. So there we, go, we have the earth. And then, then the next bit is with some um, simulations of um, tectonics. Let me turn that down a bit. So this this was a, a guy that I started chatting to, a mathematician who was really interested in um, reaction diffusion systems, um, which are sort of Alan Turing, you know, the famous um, scientist who invented the Turing machine, otherwise known as the computer, um, was really into. You know, he, another part of his work was on these systems of diffusion and how chemicals could diffuse and react at the same time and create these quite biological, like, you know, like camel stripes, for example. Uh, and this mathematician's really into these sorts of systems. So what we wanted to do was, what I asked, what I collaborated with him, or asked him if we could do would be to make this sort of alien landscape. You know, this is a part of the show. I wanted to show some sort of imaginary geological processes. Um, so it's not, it's not based on any real geological processes. I mean, it's based on principles underlying, you know, fluid dynamics and, and the mathematics behind real geological processes, but presented in an artistic manner, as much as the show is. And it just gives a nice, strange, warping um, effect. And it, he, he, he intersperses between these smooth white and these jagged black forms, and it sort of undulates. So that was a nice, nice addition to the show. Let's 
see how we're doing on time. Okay. So I'll have to be fairly quick. There's a lot of content. So, plate tectonics. Um, then that sets the stage for the beginning of um, life, I suppose. This was another interesting part of the show where I wanted to um, I wanted to show proto-life, right? So how the first cell-like structures could emerge, and the way we actually did this rather than using a, some mathematical model or just a, you know an artistic model uh, or, or artistic interpretation. We actually used this is real, real uh, immiscible liquids. So we've got oils and waters in a tiny. This is like in a little like teapot, sort of like a, like a little. Um, coffee mug sized mixture, so super zoomed in. And then it was actually a ferrofluid, so the oil part was par partially magnetic. So that whenever we send a magnetic field through it, it would produce these weird, slightly jaggedy forms like that. That's the result, the result of, this, of the magnetic fields. Again, which, that's not particularly relevant to this part of the story, it just gave a nice visual effect. But the, the really relevant thing here is that what you're seeing is what happens when oils and liquids, you know, immiscible hydrophobic and hydrophilic liquids are forced together in one space, is that naturally they'll, the oils naturally form these cells, right? They're these little particles. And that's all to do with, well, the charged nature of water and hydrogen bombs, and then the non-charged nature of fats and oils, and how the two Natural forces cause them to stop mixing and to form these little cells. And actually, our our cell membranes are a product of, a product of exactly the same process. Our cell membranes are lipid membranes, so they stay in a, in a membrane around this you know water, the, the watery interior and a watery exterior. And it's these same the same forces that are creating these cells on the video are the same exactly the same forces which create the real uh, cell membranes and real cells in biology. The only difference is that these ones are oil-filled. They're, they're, they're not, they don't have the, you know, they're not like a lipid membrane where you've got water on both sides. These are, so it's, it's not exactly the same. Obviously, we couldn't really create proto-cells in our little teacup, but um, it's, it's a sort of fairly, fairly honest representation of the processes involved. So I thought that was a good way of bringing this idea of proto-life and cell formation into the show. So from there, we go into, yeah, some stuff about DNA. So this next bit was another interesting collaboration um, with uh, the Babraham Institute in Cambridge, which is a scientific research institute. Um, and they got in touch, one of the lead researchers, he has a team there called uh, Mikhail Spivakov. He got in touch because he knew about my, what I was interested in and my work and said, oh, you know, can you come and find out what we're doing and we'll show you some of our data and maybe we can make some art from, from their data, which was a lot of fun. So I obviously went and um, what we did was we took their data on... Um, chromosome formation. So the idea with this was really to show a little bit about you know, DNA. We all, everyone's heard of DNA. We, it's the, one of the most important molecules that exists. And, it, and it, it's not the blueprint for life. It has, it has triggers. It has information. It's, it's an information-containing molecule which can direct the cell in certain ways. It doesn't contain all the information because you know, you've got other uh, you know, information is contained in you know, the, the environment of the cell and the laws of physics. And, you know, it's, but DNA is certainly one of the main uh, information carriers. Um, and their research was um, assessing in, the, in a compacted DNA molecule as it would exist inside the cell, assessing the points of contact between the strands of DNA. And then using those points of contact, there was 5,000 or so, they would then have this simulated process of annealing. So they would have, I should start it again so you can, I can show you what happens. But if you see at the start, what happens is 
It begins with, um, where's it going? Is it going to start? Um, OK, here we go. It begins with these, with the, these are all DNA strands rolled up in a big spiral. And what happens is, this is a computer simulation now, not a real, nothing in real life. So the aim of this computer simulation is to try and predict how this DNA, how all these complex strands need to fold up in order to give the best prediction of the real DNA structure. So they, had, they only had these 5,000 points of contact. They didn't know how everything was structured. So the simulation has to try and tangle and tangle and, and fold and fold until it gets to the most condensed sort of low energy state which then they say, well, this is our best prediction of the real chromosome structure. So that's the sort of science behind this part. And artistically, it was just, just really interesting to sort of get a, a view in on you know, the sorts of structures that drive life and that make us function. And really, you know, when we pass on our genetic material to our children, this is what we're passing on. You know? um, and it's, it's complex and messy, but it has certain structure as well. Uh, at the moment, it's still annealing, so I can get a bit later on. And the red areas, oops, this fell over. The red areas are areas of high gene activity. So another part of this um, project, what the scientists wanted to get across was the idea that structure and function are related. So if DNA folds up in this complex manner and a certain gene has lots of DNA wrapped around it and it, it's inaccessible, then that gene can't be switched on, so that gene's not going to operate. Uh, whereas certain areas of the molecule, they almost form these funnels. You know, there's, it's hard to see, I admit, but it'll be a bit clearer later whenever it condenses a bit further. It forms these sort of natural funnels which channel the regulators of gene expression in to certain, to certain areas, and, that's what, and then you get these big red areas where you've got lots of activity. Um, and, and it really, this project was a lot to do with showing how DNA structure can influence function. And that's the, the area of genetics called epigenetics, which is interesting because it's non-Darwinian in its, in its, the way it functions, in the sense that usually people always, you know, Darwinian evolution, you know, you have to have mutations and then they spread through the population over millions of years and that changes things slowly. But with epigenetics, what can happen is actually the experiences during your lifetime can influence the structure of your DNA molecules. And that structure can actually be passed on through methylation patterns, which I'm not, that's getting a bit too technical, I suppose, but just in case you're interested. Um, the idea is that experiences during your lifetime can influence the structure of your DNA molecules like this, and that you can then pass on that information of that structure to your children, and that can, that, that can influence how they are genetically as well. So it can be like a heritable trait which we, you know, that can occur over, the, you know, over one generation, which was unheard of you know, according to Darwinian evolution and had a lot of resistance in genetics fields because, because it was a sort of, you know, it was going against this sort of much admired idea. So that was a, that was a really interesting part of the project. Um, let's see. So I'm going to skip a couple of bits because we haven't got loads of time. But the next bit, this bit, is one of my favorites. So this is some work with a guy called Andy Lomas, who also did the cover of the, um, the album. And he's a mathematician. He, was, he did mathematics at Cambridge. And then I think he did his PhD in mathematics at Cambridge. And then he went into visual effects. He worked on The Matrix. and. Alice in Wonderland, and you know, he, he did these sort of this boundary between high-end movie visuals and mathematical systems and techniques for creating you know, the special CGI. They had whole research teams you know, for the Matrix, and he always talks about this huge research program they did for you know, like two years with a massive budget to simulate how to make this special fluid simulation just for this one scene in the Matrix where they had some lava or something. You know, it's just insane. So he, Andy, is a mathematician, but he's also really interested in art. And he spends a lot of his time doing these, amongst, you know, amongst other things, he, he, do, he does these cell simulations. And the, at the moment, we're seeing an x-ray. You know, we're seeing through. We're seeing all the cells. The it'll start becoming much more detailed whenever I show you. Um, that's another x-ray one. Let's start on the first non-x-ray so you can see it a bit clearer. Um, he makes these models of 
cells and how they can divide and how they displace their neighbors and how light and nutrients in the, in the medium can influence which cells divide and which ones don't. And he, it's, you know, his laws are all based on basic understanding of physics, I suppose, but there's no biological laws, there's no real, there's no actual laws taken from real physics. It's just a, a mathematical model of, you know, simple dividing structures. But yet, these non, you know, non-biological, non-real laws give rise to these structures that we can recognize as being, you know, it looks like biology, right? Um, and it, a lot of his, that's the really beautiful thing with this work is that, I mean, it's showing, this is literally showing emergence. He, he sets up um, these laws which are very abstract and he doesn't know what's gonna happen for each time, each um, run of the simulation. All he can do is choose the, the values of each, you know, of each variable or each parameter and then he just lets it run and we see what happens. And sometimes it makes a mess and sometimes it makes you know, something really boring or whatever, but sometimes in these areas of phase transition between extreme, you know, different types of behaviors, in these phase transition regions, you get really beautiful biological things emerging. Uh, and every time, every time he runs it, it's different. And you never know what's gonna happen. So this is just a, a great example of what emergence is. So emergence is when simple laws give rise to unexpected and often beautiful outcomes. Uh, and that's why one of his, another, another piece of work of his, which isn't cell growth, but it's sticky particle aggregation, is on the front cover of the, the album and the project, the sort of main image on the front is one of Andy's um, simulations. That's going backwards now. So let's go another one. Um, and sometimes he color labels them so that you can see, um, I think it shows the red ones or which ones are dividing and then the blue is the diffusion of nutrients I think through it, I can't even remember. Again, all of this stuff is online and explained and I highly recommend checking out Andy's work. Um, and this is great for playing music over as well, obviously. It, I can apply lots of intense effects and it gets really, yeah. It gets, it gets, it gets quite mad at this part. Yeah, I never get tired of looking at his, his work. He just has something very hypnotic about it, you know. This, you can, we can sort of see the, the emer you know, it's almost like the emergence and the, the fact that it links to nature sort of appeals to us very fundamentally. So I think this is one showing the growth factors emerging or diffusing through the structure and causing, as it spreads, it causes the cells to divide. I also think this is one where he had two different cell types, so sometimes you'll have slightly different parameters in one half than the other, and you can see that it's almost like um, one you know, bacterial colony, you know, oh, it's devouring the other one now. You can see it, look at that, it's horrible. It's just those poor bacteria, okay, now it's going backwards. And this is another, another variation on the same theme where he's got a light source at the top um, and yeah, the cells are, they grow in response to a light source. So they're naturally, you get these natural, you know, fern-like, tree-like structures emerging from, the, from this mathematical model. And some glitchy music to go with it. Okay. Well, we're quite short on time, I'll have to be fast. So. The next one, this is one of my favorite parts of the show visually. Um, and also musically, I should chat. This is an example where I was able to bring the concept of emergence into the music. So what you hear at the start of this is rain. From, it was hitting my window and I recorded this rain. And then I forced the, each raindrop hit to slowly move slightly towards positions on a drum grid. 
So I didn't define a drumming pattern, but an emergent rhythm came from the rain because I started to force what, you know, whichever grid position it was closest to, it would slowly start to move towards that one. And then I built the rest of the track around this emergent rhythm. So that was a nice, one of the few times when I could really bring the concept more explicitly into the music rather than just scoring the music to, the, to fit the part of the show or to fit, you know, to fit the visual. And, now, and, and the visual also being this general process of emergence and how um, it's called order from chaos. So it's just lots of, lots of biological emergence imagery. And I just, I like the juxtaposition, you know, it was really, it was really interesting working partly with mathematicians, partly with, um, you know, with real science data, partly with, you know, you know, visual artists who would draw, draw or Maxime uh, Corseret who did this, um, who is a, you know, computational visual artist, but he's got a very humanized, hand-drawn approach combined with these very computational approaches. It's really, yeah, it's a really nice, really nice, um, balance that he, he found. So you've got the little microorganisms feeding and all these murmurations you see in a minute with the jellyfish like the bird murmurations. I love this bit, I was just waiting for that. Just like this lovely detailed cellular form. Not, not based on any real cellular form, just inspired by biological imagery and biological processes. And this is like the murmurations here you see when birds are flocking. Again, you get these beautiful flocking patterns of birds and that is an emergent process. You know, it's something the birds don't know about that pattern or why you know, that they're doing something beautiful. They're just responding to rules and behavioral patterns. And when we look at it, we see something you know, art coming from these, what can be simple natural processes. And that's really, the whole, whole show is really hinged on that, you know, just this idea that, um, that nature is full of art inherently. So now we get into, finally, humans have arrived. Uh, and I wanted to, again, as with much of the show, each chapter is sort of looking at the processes and the natural laws and you know, what's operating, what's you know, operating beneath and what that can yield. And in this case, I wanted to look at the human as a machine, you know, in a very hand-drawn sort of comic sort of style by Henning and Led Lederer. So it goes into, yeah, it's called the human machine and it goes into these, I'll fast forward it, but you've got like the lungs, you know, with the fire and pumps, it's like this, and, it, and the circulatory system, the heart pumping the, pumping the blood around. It's just a fun way of, yeah, showing the human, the way humans work using all these cogs and machines. So I won't stay on that too long. The next part of the show I did was, So the next part of the show I did was, well, I wanted to give a little attention to the emergence of um, self-awareness, right? You know, this important, not a, not a scientific thing really, but just something that I thought was really important in this story. And I, the way I thought how to do that was, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have an emergent eye and have the audience sort of looking back at themselves as this way of representing this, this process of the emergence of self-awareness. So what happens is it, it goes eventually, it transitions into this sort of eye structure. I'm just fast forwarding here. And then 
it's, this is the last sort of nice bit. I wanted to go a little bit, not dystopian, but I wanted to bring in some more modern, you know, the trials of modern life into the show a little bit. So what I did was, it starts to get a lot more hectic in this part of the show, and the humans have arrived, and now we've got this, you know, process of civilization and development and, you know, and I wanted to try and, you know, show that visually and, and also musically, with, you know, and it gets more tense and aggressive. So we've got these nice sort of growing, like old school SimCity style visual. This, this goes into um, sort of the emergence of, well, human replication. So we get a little um, artistic license thesis emergence here. It's a nice, you know, pleasing form. And again, it's toying with this idea of, you know, visual emergence as well, you know, the audience, obviously I don't need to explain what's going on, like, what's this, what's going on? And then the fetus comes, and then maybe you think, oh, okay, so that's, it. you start with this sections about humans replicating, and oh, it's, it's getting crazy and bad, and yeah, it gets super glitchy. Um, and then it gets more... Then I wanted to show a little bit about um, the capitalist machine, I suppose. This, this bit, I, this is one of my favorite bits, it's fun. It's like the man stuck inside the capitalist machine and you know, the, all the things in modern life, he has to do yoga and go shopping and brush his teeth and stuff. And he, but he's, he's inside this machine of cogs. It's the same guy that did the human machine part and now it's applied to wider society. Um, and again, quite glitchy and quite aggressive musically. Um, that was another fun, fun thing to toy with. I'm going to have to skip a couple of bits. We're out of time pretty much. Anyway, you get the idea. He's in the machine, there's all the cogs and the financial system and uh, he's doing shopping and... But he's stuck in there, right? He's just another part of the system. I like this bit here, he pushes their friend off the edge. That was the yoga. You gotta wash your clothes. Oh, and the cameras, obviously. So anyway, this is, I, we had fun with that. And in the end, you know, it just goes forward and eventually it zooms out to show the human. Um, I'll, there's just a couple of small, more little bits to show. Again, so now the, the, this timeline narrative continues. You know, we started off with this pre-Big Bang and then we went into this early universe and then we early life and... There was actually an evolution section, which I had to skip out to some extent because we've run out of time. But um, this was now going further into the future. Um, and this, I mean, this guy really went to town on this story. He really built this masterpiece of you know, storytelling. And he, he, he created this before the US election. Um, and it features a lot of Trump um, uh, warmongering which was quite prophetic of the guy, the artist, um, uh, R.C. Axon, who, who created this. Um, so I'll just show a, a little tiny bit of it. So again, this is really veering away from the, the, sci the really sort of science angles and 
veering more into social commentary and emergence of in that sense. And yeah, I thought that was a nice way. It was just a nice way of grounding the project because a lot of the time when people come to the live show, right, they don't, I don't get to stand up and explain what's happening. So it makes it quite, it, it grounds things whenever I can show that simple progression. You know, the star is very abstract. Then you have lots of you know, universe, star stuff. Then you have lots of life cell things. And then you have your know, human structures and cities. And people can see that narrative quite clearly. And then they can link that in with emergence. Oh, I can, they, it makes sense. You know, the whole thing can, you can get the gist of what the show's about. Um, so these parts sort of ground it in that sense that they show that emergent process. Even though this is not strictly a scientific idea, this is just, uh, you know, this is storytelling. So this robot, this is about the emergence of um, altruism. Uh, and this robot sort of decides to help, help another robot and Donald Trump doesn't like it. Although it's not, it's not Donald Trump. I, like, I might get put in prison or something when I go to the States, I don't worry about that. Um, it's someone who looks a bit like that. Um, and, and then, so then there's this bomb coming in, and they don't know what to do, and the president wants to fire his nukes. So we've got some horribly prophetic thing going on here, which hopefully never happens, but um, what are we going to do? So they go to war. And look, it turns out that the president, oh, wait a second, are we gonna see it? Don't do it. But no, look, the president is an alien. Not again. And he presses the button. So you go, that's what's gonna happen. But don't worry, the robot, the friendly robot saves the day, sort of. So. Then, really, that's getting towards the end of the show. There was just two more little bits, which, um, the first of which was, um, let's see if I can get that. The first of which was really just looking at sort of future, you know, past, you know, distant future, and then, you know, these sort of like strange life forms in the forest and this more um, utopian sort of association of nature and life, I suppose, and, the, and empty, empty cities. So that's this sort of abstracted future part. And then it finishes with um, Unbounded, which was, I wanted, a, I wanted a way of sort of having a non-ending ending. So I gave a visual artist a, you know, the task of, can you make something, you know, can you show infinity, you know, without using, I didn't want to use normal fractals, because you know, normal fractals are so overused um, visually. So this is the end of the album and the end of the, you know, the, the visual story in a, an infinite zoom, but a sort of warping, unusual and infinite zoom. Um, and sort of ambient music to, to lead out, just as a way of leaving the story open-ended and, you know, I didn't want to have some sort of, you know, strict ending to it. But yeah, I think we're pretty much, I better stop now because otherwise there's not going to be much time for questions. Um, so that's how it ends, and some nice music. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for wading through that. It definitely went longer than I expected. Not much longer, so that's good.
Are there any questions for Max? Yes. <laughs> Uh, Max, first of all, I would like to say just I cannot decide what was uh, the most uh, impressive for me, what I like, music, visual part, or the idea of uh, mixing with the science. I think they're all really amazing. It was really smart, and thank you. Thank but you. I would like just to uh, know, can you bit explain more about the music part? Yeah. Like how is the process? Is it first you create music and then you make visual parts, or uh, it was, together at the same time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a mixture. Um, the the idea came first, you know. This I, I knew I wanted to do this project which linked together my different interests in you know, music and science and visual art, and I was okay. This here's an idea that I can you know emergence, and I I knew that I could have lots of sub chapters within that, and I started devising that what are the sub chapters. So that was the beginning. Then whether the music or the visual came first after that was varied. Sometimes I would contact a visual artist and explain you know what. Could you make this thing? You know, the human machine. I want to, you know, and, and he would send in, with Henning that time. He would send, um, you know, sketches, and then I would send some music back to him, and we would bounce it back and forth. Whereas sometimes I would create the track, you know, first, and then I would send the piece of music to the visual artist and say, "This is the piece of music I want it to fit in this part of the story, and I want to you know, brief them on the on the visual ideas." And actually, a lot of the time, I sent. I would have the way I worked was because I didn't have a lot of budget. What I would do was I would have a doc, a big document with lots of you know chapters in there, like the human machine and you know the the, the cell forms and whatever else the, the, the weird aliens in in the future. Um, and I would have all these different parts um, explained in words. And I would also have you know some musical sketches for, as well. And I would send different visual artists a, you know a few different options so they could read about them and. We, then they could send me back some ideas, and they could find what would work for them. And you know, so it was really there wasn't one way. We had I had to be really maximally flexible with how I worked, and just to sort of fit it all together. And even now, I'm still doing projects which are sort of, I'm sort of dropping in, you know, because it's such a wide emergence is such a wide ranging concept, and and this idea of this timeline from you know this timeline, this universe timeline, it gives me so much scope artistically and creatively that I keep sort of dropping new bits in and. It's an ongoing process. Yeah. I was yesterday, I was in your show. Oh, yeah. And uh, I liked it very much. And I thought the whole night about uh, yeah, what you are telling now. You are uh, in the introduction, she said, you are a scientist. But, uh, and, and several times you said uh, that you are based in your work on data. And then uh, emerged uh, this question in me. So uh, what's my uh, opinion about beautiful? Uh, when I think something is beautiful, because like an artist, you choose for beautiful. That's my opinion. And so I, I was uh, thinking, should I put the question like this more, uh, uh, are you more an, uh, a scientist or are you more uh, an artist? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess these days I'm not a scientist. Officially speaking, I'm not a scientist at all. I, I finished my postdoc in 2008. So I've been touring for nearly 10 years with music, during which time I read when I'm on the plane. I'm always reading science, and I, you know, it's what I'm interested in. But really, I'm a you know, musician or an artist these days. And my science is my hobby. It's sort of swapped around. It used to be the other way around for years. My science, I always assumed, would be my job, and when music was my hobby. And then I went into that process of, um, you know, the funding, getting funding for my own research, and up funding applications, and you know, the postdoc process. And it was really painful. And um, my music, and suddenly I was, and I was getting requests to do gigs because I was releasing music as a hobby. And then I thought, oh, why not try this full time for a while? And then that was 10 years ago now, nearly well, nine years ago, and I've just been. So yeah, this is, I guess that's the whole reason I'm doing these sorts of things is that I still love science. And I wish I was a scientist perhaps, but this is my way of getting to collaborate with scientists and think about those ideas and sort of still, uh, and still be able to tour and do, you know, do music. So, but primarily I'm an artist, yeah.
Max, thank you for the story of life. Really cool. Um, I was wondering, there is also, you can make music in uh, like a, a herd. Do you also do uh, stuff with that? Because every herd can give a different feeling. It's also a way of science, right? Sorry, the, what was that? The hertz? Yeah, what hertz. were we saying? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the, the, the question, please? Um, are you also using uh, different hertz for different... You mean the tuning, for, you know, when you tune to... Yeah, I don't... Like music. You mean the different tuning regime is for 32 hertz or whatever it is? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I've read into that and I don't think there's any real basis for, for it. Um, you know, this, the idea is that you can sort of tune things to fit more in line with natural frequencies or something like that, but for me, I've done some reading around that and it just stunk of sort of pseudoscience. I didn't, so I, I yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I, I haven't seen anything con that convinced me that that was legitimate. Um, yeah. Sorry, that really harsh answer. I apologize. No, no, I, no. I think that's the thing. Like, I guess I come from a scientific background, so, and especially doing what I do, it's very unusual, perhaps. Um, and I, I'm doing my own things, which other people could say, "Oh, that's nonsense," you know. So there's always, it's, it's really hard. So you just have to. I, I think for me, anyway, whenever I look at these things, I'm always just trying to find the source, you know, where, what's the source, um, what's the evidence for this, and I still approach that from a quite hard-edged sort of science-y background, and if something comes from some weird research institution funded by itself, you know, publishing its own research and, and peer-reviewing by the friend, you know, then I don't, I just generally I'll ignore it. Um, but that's bad because the thing is, for every hundred, you know, for, in those areas of really extreme ideas, some of them will be legitimate and that becomes the next thing, you know? So it's really hard to know how to, how to, um, how to judge these things, especially in, especially in the current. I mean, that ties into the, the whole idea, this sort of fact idea about around this festival, isn't it? This, you know, the, the whole, the, the, ta the tagline is, is about no facts, no future, right? And it's how do you define what's a, what a fact is and, you know, it's, so in, that was one example where I decided I wasn't going to go for it, but I could certainly be wrong. Max, uh, thanks for a wonderful performance last night and a um, great lecture just now. Um, I was wondering if you could tell a little bit more about the equipment that you use on stage and how the actual performance comes about. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I, I sometimes would do that earlier, but I didn't have a chance. So obviously I worked with lots of different visual artists. So sometimes when you go and see a visual show, um, people will be using live generative visuals where they're actually creating the visual, generating the whole, what you see live and they, have, they can control all sorts of parameters. It generally looks a bit more lo-fi, but it's super tight, tightly synced to the music. I didn't go through that approach because I was working with many different visual artists and I wanted to achieve this sort of Lots of different visual styles, but also that, that high-end render, you know, where you can get really detailed renders. So I couldn't do the live rendering. Um, so what I do is I have loads of video clips, as, which I can layer. And I have loads of audio clips, which, again, I can layer. And I send MIDI messages from these two controllers um, into Ableton. Uh, Ableton Live, just you know, a digital audio workstation, which is good for, I make all my music in Ableton as well as using it for live performance. So I just send MIDI messages into Ableton, and then I use Resolume, uh, which is a VJing software. And there's, a, there's special uh, Max for Live, there's plugins for, for Ableton, which allow you to sync um, audio clips to video clips, and also allow you to, I, set, I spent a long time, one of the main things I spent a long time on was figuring out how to make changes in the video which seem to fit with changes in the audio. So, for example, if I'm using a filter and I'm filtering in a sound and it's slowly coming in, how can I have that the filter value? Oh, yeah, you've got one here. I wonder if I can actually show it. How can I have the filter value synced with a visual effect which seems to fit? So I, I actually spent a lot of time having to work with... Um, sort of 
ratio maps, I suppose. So if you've got a, a straight line of a filter you know, frequency change, what sort of curve do I need on a particular visual effect to make it sort of feel right and, it's, and look right? So I spent a lot of time, there's a, loads of faffing around in Ableton, um, getting, just getting the right feel. And once I have that, I have a whole suite of effects. So I can just jam with the visuals, sorry, with the audio, and all the controls then feed through to the visuals as well. So basically, I can have a very compact system which I can tour with uh, and control both at the same time. And there's only a few controls which only do the audio or only do the video, but mostly it's just a homemade sort of interface. But this software is, you know, readily it's out there and it's actually not that difficult because I hadn't done much with the visuals before. So uh, having coming from just using Ableton to learning Resolume, Resolume's quite similar to Ableton in, in its sort of flow and the way it's set up. And the, this mapping, these mapping devices allow you to Basically, I've got all my audio and clips in this grid, and the same grid maps to the visual clips. So I can, if I, all I've got to do is place the clips in the right position, the two grids match up. If I trigger that one, that one gets triggered in parallel. So it's a really nice way of being able to trigger both at the same time. And then there's lots of, like I was talking about, lots of um, filter sweeps and glitchy effects. And I guess we were at the show, I guess I spent a lot of time messing around with these, these sort of things, which, yeah. So it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty, simple, out-of-the-box type system, but just requires some time to set it up, get your own, I guess, what you like visually and what you like in terms of what sort of controls you want to have in your, in your audio setup and how you want the two to, to interrelate. I hope that answers it a little bit. Um, uh, thanks, Max. Um, uh, I have a pseudo-science uh, question for you. Uh, Good. You have a Lots of pseudoscience in here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's my, as I said earlier, mine's is not all proper science by any means. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I think it's great. Uh, you've you've thought a lot about uh, emergence, of course. Um, I do as well, and, and uh, I'm I'm a little bit struggling with the thought of living in a simulation. And uh, I'm I'm curious, what is your thought about that? Um, oh, it's a fun idea. It's a nice argument, right? You know, if we're, there's going to be more simulations than real ones, so we're going to be in the simulation. Um, but no, it's, um, it's fun, but it's one of those ideas which I think when you, you sort of, if you put your sensible hat on, you say, oh, it's probably not true. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, there's an argument that you would need such a big computer to simulate what's going on, then it sort of becomes inefficient to some extent. It becomes unreasonable to, yeah, to, to achieve, um, unless you can, comp you know, compress things a lot. And there are, so I, I saw there was something, some paper, every so often a paper pops up, doesn't it, and someone's got some new evidence as to why we're in a simulation. I saw well, there was only one a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, it's fun, but I think that's what it is. Hi, Max. Hi. Thank you for your amazing work. Super inspiring. Um, I was wondering, your visuals, um, most of them, they follow all these um, uh, mathematical rules and like algorithms and, and generative design principles. And I was wondering, uh, maybe your mu music does that already, but does your music follow some of these patterns as well? Or could you imagine certain parts of your music or certain sounds yeah. being based on those it, rules as It's well? a difficult one. I've played a lot with... It's really hard to use data explicitly um, in music. I mean, a lot of people do it, but it's hard to do it and it still be musical. That's the, that's the challenge. Um, so for the most part, it's me acting more like a, you know, scoring like a, you know, something that fits the movie as such, rather than um, trying to seed data into, into the sound. Because Music is really specific in terms of what sort of data it is. Uh, and if you just take a random data source, it's just, it's just noise. Um, and you can put noise in there, but it doesn't add anything. It, you know, I, yeah, you can't tell that there's a link there. And I, I think that was always the aim with the project, was just to show something beautiful and something interesting, but something that could, 
you could actually see something in there that could tell you something deep about the, the, the ideas behind it. It's not just there for the sake of it. It's, they're, it's supposed to be informative. I mean, it was informative for me learning about a lot of things I didn't know about and going through the process. So in that sense, I didn't want to just put noise and say, oh, the white noise in this music is the data of this DNA, because who cares? Or, you know, it, so yeah, you're, it, I'd love to do that, and it's something I've experimented with, and there are projects where we keep trying to do it, but in this, we didn't do that in any meaningful way, really. Um, you mentioned that for you, um, science is also like a hobby, so you're showing us also just as uh, something you like to create together with your music. Um, I really enjoy the music as such, and, and the visualizations are, when it comes to science background, it's also fascinating. Are you also trying to use these visualizations to inspire people, or to inspire a generation to become more interested in what you are showing? Um, I, I I mean, I would like it if that did happen, but maybe I'm a bit more selfish than that, you know? It's sort of like, I, I love, I get so much happiness from working with these, you know, talking to scientists and looking at, you know, working with the ideas and just looking at, you know, the, 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 their data and, and thinking of how you can present it artistically. I, I get so much enjoyment from that. I'd probably be lying if I said I was doing it for the sake of, you know, education. but. That said, um, yeah, I, I, hope, I hope that it makes people think about something maybe they hadn't thought about before or it encourages people to be interested in science for sure. I mean, I, it's really important that um, science is presented in different ways because often it can be, I mean, the way I learned science at school was pretty dull. Um, and there's so many amazing, mind-blowing things in there, you know? Um, and, yeah, I, I, I definitely want to encourage you know people to learn about that stuff because yeah, it's it's really fun. So I, ho I hope it I hope it does have that effect. Yeah, even though that wasn't the it wasn't designed to be like that, but for sure, yeah, I would like to encourage. It's a quick trigger. You don't have to explain everything. Yeah, and that's the way. Yeah, that's the way it's presented generally. I don't like I said earlier. I don't try and force feed the science angle. It's more just showing something that looks interesting and sounds interesting maybe and just the information's all there if people want to find out more but I don't want to force them to do that it's something that just maybe to spark some curiosity that's yeah definitely the aim more questions yeah hi so uh, when I was in your show yesterday, I was enjoying the visuals and I didn't really feel like dancing. Yeah. But uh, there was this point uh, when I felt, okay, this is the time now for me. And I looked around I, and I thought that everyone has this point at the same moment uh, as I had. And uh, my question is, do you think that you can control people in your show? Like this. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's why I'm doing the visuals and the lights and the music, because I'm a control freak, right? <laughs> it's, um, um, I don't know if it's so much control. It's, the way I approach it is always um, a two-way conversation. So I, I sometimes, you know, for example, if I turned up to play the, the show here for, a sit, for us sitting down, it wouldn't be nearly as intense and as dancey as it was last night. Um, there has to be the two-way conversation between me and the audience. Um, and actually, you know, my background musically was, I used to DJ, for, I still DJ sometimes, but I did that for a long time and really the key with that is just trying to interact with people and trying to understand what they like and what you like and you know, so I don't want to force things on people too much. It's always a halfway. Um, if anything, I force the glitchy stuff on people, and and they put up with it, and then they wait for the next bit where they can dance more easily. So that's the usual conversation. Um, yeah, I hope that answers enough.
Uh, I was wondering what you are using to do the glitches with, because once in a while you use the iPad to twist mm. the music and the visuals at the same time. What is it that you're using there? Yeah, so the I should have mentioned that earlier when I was explaining the equipment. Um, the iPad app is called Lemur, um, and it's just a, a MIDI control app, so you can build control surfaces, anything you want, with bouncing parts, and that's just a simple pad with you know 50 or so different uh, triggers. Uh, and actually, each trigger is launching a different sound that you know, I've created from you know, during my production, so lots of different glitchy sounds. Um, and then it feeds through delays and some different sorts of effects, which I can then make it weirder with. Uh, so that's the live bit, but actually there's a lot of production, there's a lot of studio production behind that. It's not, you know, there's each, all the sounds are carefully built and there's a lot of toil that's gone into creating the glitchiness. I mean, glitchiness, people often ask, how do you make glitchiness? Um, the answer really is lots, everything you can think of, lots of mess and lots of rendering and, and then picking out bits. So you really, you just, you're trying to create maximum chaos. So you, loads of different sorts of, different types of effects, spectral effects and, and weird delays and reverbs and lots of randomization and tying one parameter to another. And I, I spend a lot of time using Max for Live devices. Max for Live is like a great addition to Ableton, which just opens up Ableton so you can have Actually, it's, it's very linked to this emergence idea. So what, what I'll do is um, I'll set up lots of devices in Ableton which randomize many parameters. And sometimes I'll have a synth with almost every parameter on a, you know, on a random LFO. So it's just total chaos. And, and, and I'll set up lots of parameters, map to lots of others, and, and build a sort of a system inside you know, the digital audio workstation, which is out of my control to some extent and very chaotic and makes the right mess. And then, and then I'll just let it run and, and play with it and, and you have to get the constraints right. But once you get the constraints right, you get the happy medium between, like the start of the show, between order and chaos. It's like this natural process uh, and you get that happy medium. And once you've found that, you just record the audio or, and then let it run, record it, jam with it. And then you go back to the audio, start picking little bits out. Um, and then you start sequencing them and then apply the whole process again. And you can iteratively build this complexity with these sort of partly random systems. Um, so that's, I mean, glitch comes, it sounds complex because the process that yields it is complex. It's just a matter of applying as many different things as you can think of and spending a lot of time editing and, and recording and tweaking. Yeah, there's no secret glitch effect thing that, that would be nice. But then if there was, everyone would use that same thing and it wouldn't be interesting anymore. It's like, you know, um, yeah. Right. Well, I have uh, one short question for the last one for you. Um, so this is a huge, it's been a huge project. Do you have uh, any projects that you're working on now for the future? Do you have uh, any dreams or things coming up? Um. I'm having a baby in January, so all my dreams are shattered. <laughs> yeah, his dreams are off the table. Um, uh, I'm finishing a new album, basically. I've got a new album I have to finish before the baby arrives. Um, and I won't tell you too much about that, but it's a project, it's a, another concept-based project, um, which will also be audiovisual, um, and which is related you know, vaguely related to this, but obviously something new. But I won't tell you what it is. As Sorry. an ecologist, I would think you would do more uh, ecology-based work as well. Oh, yeah. No, I, I would, yeah, I'd love to do, I'd love to do a real, a real, because I'm a biologist originally, you know, I'd, I'd love to do a really focused, you know, biology, you know, you know biology-inspired and, you know, project. And I, I think I will do it at some point. Um, but the time hasn't come yet. All right. Well, thank you all uh, for your attention and uh, give a huge applause for Max Cooper.